Understanding trauma is hard. The existing theoretical material can be extremely overwhelming. Even if you can manage the sheer volume of theoretical material on the subject, there is no knowing what would work in practice. This video focuses on the compilation of an interaction with my mentor on childhood trauma and its impact. Our interaction helped me gain perspective and understand how trauma can be approached better in practice. Where do I start? I think it helps if I use a case for discussion. This will help you understand the dynamics that come into play in practice. But before I share the case, I would like you to keep a few things in mind. Make a note that major traumatic events can change the way children perceive themselves and others and change the way they behave. Another thing that should be noted is that abuse, including sexual abuse, can be disabling and should not be treated as just an unfortunate experience. Knowing about childhood trauma will help you to understand and respond appropriately to a child. Let's take an example. Nakul is a 9-year-old boy who you interact with at an NGO where the Child Welfare Committee has placed him. Your interaction with Nakul makes you realize that he knows very specific details about sexual intercourse, something that is not expected of a 9-year-old. During a subsequent meeting with Nakul, you find out that he was very close with his uncle. You're talking with him now and he is telling you about how he is good at keeping secrets like the one that stayed between him and his uncle. While telling you about the secret, the boy's voice drops. He stops making eye contact and he appears to withdraw. What is happening? What do these signs indicate? Nakul is relieving his very frightening experience at the hands of a trusted member of the family and is likely feeling scared, helpless and vulnerable. He is becoming distressed and using a trauma-informed approach, we can try to interrupt his progressively worsening anxiety. For example, we can acknowledge his emotions bring him back to the present emotionally and offer him choice and control. We are aware of his distress and seek to address it. We might say, I can see this is really hard for you, Nakul. You've been through some very difficult and painful times that no one should have to experience. I appreciate you telling me about them. You have a lot of courage, Nakul. Pause. Would you like to take a break or maybe have a glass of water? What is this approach called? This strategy is referred to as the trauma-informed approach to interacting with children. The trauma-informed approach embodies several critical concepts. It takes into account the impact of trauma on a person and encourages us to make every effort to minimize any re-traumatization that may occur during our efforts to help.
When using a trauma-informed approach, we avoid asking irrelevant questions about the trauma events, which may cause unnecessary anxiety and stress. And we avoid blaming or shaming a child for what happened to them. We are acutely aware of verbal and non-verbal cues that the child is becoming distressed while speaking with us and promptly takes steps to soothe their anxiety. Let's say I am a doctor, a counsellor or a police officer. I need to question Nakul about his experiences with abuse. Before beginning to ask sensitive questions about his traumatic past, I say, Nakul, we've been talking for a while about things you like to do and your favourite sports. Now, I'd like to ask you some questions about your life with your father, his relatives. The reason I need to ask you these questions is to find out more about what happened to see if there is something I can do to help you now and in the future. But you don't have to answer my questions if you feel uncomfortable. Or you can answer some but not all of them. We can go as slowly or quickly as you like. Is it okay if I ask you some questions? The trauma-informed approach is victim-centered, that is, all actions and decisions regarding the traumatized child are done with the child's best interests in mind. These best interests must take priority over the needs of investigators to build a legal case, the needs of medical providers to follow a given protocol, or the desires of service providers to accommodate parental requests. The child comes first. In this way, I have maintained transparency about all that is happening. This reduces stress related to uncertainty. I've obtained truly informed consent and have demonstrated respect for the child's desires and feelings. I have given him a choice and a sense of control. This empowers him and further conveys respect. 